in the <laughs> through the school year, uh, my grandparents had built a camp on the Kennebecasis River in the 1940s, and we we were lucky enough to spend every summer there um, until just about a year ago, when unfortunately we had to sell it. Um, but I spent my childhood there, and I remember as a kid being told, uh, one of my neighbors told me that the Kennebecasis River um, was named after my Uncle Ken, who lived down the road. <clears throat> and I was a smart kid and knew that that was probably not true, but I didn't know what Kennebecasis meant. And actually, when I was teaching in Wagoma First Nation in uh, probably in the late 90s or early 2000s, one of my, my colleagues and friends gave me um, a Gloose Cap story. Gloose Cap is um, a, a key figure in the creation of Mi'kmaq territory. And um, he provided me with a Gloose Cap creation story. And, and I was reading it and it talked about how Gloose Cap chased Beaver from his home on Long Island. Um, which is right here. And how he chased Beaver down the Kennebecasis River and up the St. John River, um, throwing, throwing boulders at him. And if you go far enough up the St. John River, you come to Tobik First Nation um, where there's islands in the river. And, and this is the story of the creation of those islands. And um, this, this story really touched me in a way because this is a place that has been sacred to my family, but was sacred for many, many, many generations long before my family arrived, that it, it, it appears in stories. Um, Kennebec cases actually means little long bay and it's a Mi'kmaq word. Um, and actually this is, this, this river, the, the St. John River is known um, in both Mi'kmaq and the Wolastuic language as the Wolastuk River, which means the beautiful river. And so you'll hear of Wolastuic people um, who live on, on this side of the river, <laughs> um, who you may know as Maliseet, but the proper name is Wolastuk. Uh, and the other side of the river is Mi'kmaq territory. And so um, the river actually divides Mi'kmaq territory from Wolastuic territory. And I grew up in this territory. Um, I, I grew up deeply connected to this place, but didn't know the stories of the place. And so when I think about recognizing territory and honoring the territory, the places we are rooted, um, for me, it is really about learning the stories of the territory, learning the stories of the land, learning what the land can teach us. And so I've spent a lot of my time actually spending, I dig into language and I, I really try to learn about the language. There's a great um, website. If you live in Nova Scotia or are interested in Nova Scotia, there's a great website called Mi'kmaq Place Names and you can go on there and find the place names, um, the traditional place names and every little nook and corner of Nova Scotia has a Mi'kmaq name. And it tells us about what was done there or what the geography is or what, what people gathered there. I'm right now in Naliganich, Aniganich, which is the place of the broken branches. Um, or there's also a different interpretation. It's the place where the bears broke branches, um, gathering berries. And so it's this, this idea of things that happened here. And every little piece of the land has a story and my job as a settler is to learn the stories of this land. And that's how I acknowledge territory because I, I find it troubling when people just read a statement and then go on about their regular day. Um, I'm really in, inspired by Hayden King's call. What does it compel us to do? And for me, it compels me to do the work to come to know this territory in a meaningful way. And so I have spent um, about 30 years of my life now working in um, Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities trying to support um, education and learning. And I started my career um, back when I was just a student. I was a student volunteer in a, an organization um, 
called X Project, which is at St. FX. And this is my myself and my husband with our dear friend, the late Joan Dillon, who was one of the founders of X Project. And X Project was, um, X Project still is, I still run X Project <laughs> um, <laughs> off from the side of my desk. Um, but X Project was committed to working in community and started in 1965. Um, committed to working in Black and Mi'kmaq communities to support ed education, recreation, and leadership. And it was in X Project that I got the opportunity to meet a lot of community members um, and to really learn from community members. I still recall to this day um, an elder from a local Mi'kmaq community telling me that she was not prepared to sacrifice another generation of children waiting for the school system to change. And she was talking about the need to really decolonize and transform um, education. And that was in the late 80s or early 90s. And, and that stuck with me. And I, I sometimes wonder if she understands how much that stuck with me because it really, it really guided me along the path of my, my teaching and my work and my research. Um, this is another picture here of a youth leadership week in an X project. And I just have to say that Claire is in this room right now. <laughs> she, Claire, that's you. <laughs> anyway, uh, when she came out, I was like, oh my gosh, you're in my presentation. Um, this is uh, our, our youth leadership weekends that we used to have. Um, and we still have them. And hopefully when COVID's over, we'll have one again. Um, but it was really a time for kids to come together and, and, and to learn together. And, um, and, and it shaped everything that I've done since. And one of the most important things I learned was the importance and significance of being a learner, going into community as a learner first. And being a learner was really um, key in the work that I've done. So as I said, I, I moved to Cape Breton to find work. Um, I worked in Wagamo First Nation. You'll see all of the, the communities that you see here are Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia. And 12 of the 13 of them form a collective known as Mi'kmaq Ginnamatnui. I started in Wagoma in 1995, teaching um, high school math. So grade seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. We didn't have grade 12 that year. So um, we added it the following year. Um, but in 1993, the federal government transferred jurisdiction of education to the bands. And so in 1993, schools went from being federal schools to being band controlled schools, the schools in the communities. And at the time, the community started to work together to form a collective. And that collective later became Mi'kmaq Ginnamatnui. Uh, Mi'kmaq Ginnamatnui works together on all things related to education. Kyla is in the room tonight. She works at Mi'kmaq Ginnamatnui as a math coach. And um, so the communities negotiate together. They work on, on education together. They do professional learning together. Um, and through that, that building of capacity, um, lots of great things have happened. One of those things is teacher training programs. So a partnership between Mi'kmaq and Amatnui and St. FX was established in 1996. And since 1996, St. FX has trained uh, over 150 um, Mi'kmaq teachers who now teach in the school systems. Um, and about, I think 75 or 80 of them have come back to do master's degrees. And we have a couple now in the PhD program. And so when you go into an MK school, the teachers are Mi'kmaq, the administrators are Mi'kmaq, the director of education is Mi'kmaq. And so there's been this real shift in capacity. And, and, and what the change has resulted is that the graduation rates in these schools are now often higher than the provincial graduation rates. So they hover around 85 to 90% every year, sometimes higher. Um, and that's, that's more than double the national average for graduation rates for Indigenous kids. So we're doing some things right. Um, we could still do a little bit more math, <laughs> but uh, we're definitely doing some, some things right. So I started, as I said, in 1995. This is me. Um, this is me right here. My young, my young little self. Hang on. Me. People used to come into my class and ask me where my teacher was. Um, but uh, 
These are my very first group of grade sevens. That was my homeroom class. It was 1995. And there was this comment that I used to hear in my class and it was be good or you'll go to Shuby school. And it was said often kind of tongue in cheek by the students in the class. And I didn't know what Shuby school was. And I had to ask. And this one student said to me, you know, miss, it's the place where the Ulnu kids go. Ulnu is the word Mi'kmaq people call themselves. That means our people. Um, it's the place where the Ulnu kids go and they get beaten by the nuns and the priests. Now that school had actually closed in 1967, but it lived in the hearts and the minds of the kids even till this day in 1995. But the other thing that happened in 1995 is that um, Nora Bernard, who was a Mi'kmaq elder from Millbrook First Nation near Truro, Nova Scotia, um, began speaking about, out about her experiences in residential school and demanding um, compensation for survivors. Um, this really followed from Isabel's, Isabel Knockwood's book, Out of the Depths, which was written in 1992, which recounted their experiences at Shubenacadie School. And it was that call that led to um, the largest class action lawsuit this country has ever seen, which resulted in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so in my career as an educator, I have walked alongside the community of Wegoma. Um, I taught alongside survivors, residential school survivors and their descendants. And so I've been privy to this journey of reconciliation from a community perspective. And I recognize my obligation as a settler to address it. And so I start to think about math. I'm a math teacher. What is my role in reconciliation? What, do, what can I do to, to transform my practice? And I think about whose math are we doing? I used to say to the kids all the time, like just because the math of Mi'kmaq people didn't get written down in textbooks, it doesn't mean it didn't exist, right? And so for me, it was really like helping kids to understand that, that we've told a story in mathematics, but it's only one version of the story. I love this quote by Rochelle Gutierrez, where she says, you know, when we talk about things like pi and Pythagorean theorem, we're reinforcing this idea that only the Greeks did mathematics or other Europeans. And in fact, we know that's not the case. We know, in fact, Pythagoras himself studied in Africa and brought that knowledge back to Greece. Um, you know, we're going to talk in a minute about pi and how the Mi'kmaq people knew that before they knew there was a Greece. Um, and so, you know, as Joseph in his book, uh, The Crest of the Peacock talks about how, you know, with colonization, it was about suppressing some stories and elevating others, right? Elevating the stories of the, the, the colonizer and suppressing the stories of the colonized. And that happened in math too, so that we see that the contributions of, of colonized peoples, um, people most impacted by colonialism haven't been honored in our math classes. And it creates this myth that math is value free or neutral. So for me, reconciliation and decolonization is really a piece of telling a different story about mathematics. And so I've really been striving to tell different stories in my math class. And so when we ask textbook companies to decolonize math, they do stuff like this. <laughs> um, so, you know, folding jingles for your jingle dress where you have 185 more than your sister. Um, what this tells me is that the person who wrote this question actually doesn't know what a jingle dress is because the jingle dress is a prayer dress. And the tradition of the jingle dress is that one cone a day was added for every day of the year and they were prayed on. And so every jingle dress is supposed to have 365 cones. So the idea that you might have 185 more than your sister is a bit problematic. Or, or it's purchasing a Métis flag because if you go out and buy a Métis flag, now it's indigenous knowledge and math, right? Uh, no, it's still just buying something. It's still consumerism and it's still an area and perimeter problem, right? Or this one was one of my, my, my favorites. Um, 
as really not what to do, which was uh, making and selling plastic anukshuks to tourists. Um, <laughs> again, uh, it, it totally misses the sacredness of, of the anukshuk, right? And so these are things that are currently in a grade 10 textbook being used in this province and many other provinces across the country that passed our provincial bias review. So I'm striving to do something that isn't that. Um, and apologies if any of you wrote these questions. Um, so how can math education support reconciliation? And for me, it's really about how do we honor community ways of knowing, being, and doing as a starting point for learning mathematics instead of adding on to the mathematics curriculum, right? Or sprinkling in or changing a context in a question that hasn't really changed the question. So I really work at, I draw from a lot of scholars who are talking about decolonization as sort of recentering and reclaiming and, and elevating the voices of indigenous communities, indigenous peoples, making meaningful connections to the culture and to the knowledge um, really finding ways to center those ways of knowing, being, and doing that what we call worldview, or later I'll, I'll introduce you to the term Olnuida Simk, Mi'kmaq ways of knowing. Um, but in every culture would have a, a word like that that talks about their worldview or their ways of knowing. And so I really strive to think about mathematics that's rooted in a way of indigenous ways of knowing or indigenous epistemology. And, and I recognize that it requires an unlearning, right? Marie Batiste, who is um, really an inspirational scholar for me, talks about how we're all marinated in colonialism. And so this idea, we've all been immersed in this, these colonial stories, right? The elevation of, of some stories and the oppression of others. And so we need to recognize those moments and we need to learn a different way, which requires unlearning. Um, Dwayne Donald talks a lot about um, unlearning colonialism. And so for me, there's a line in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that I think sums up <laughs> reconciliation for me in a way that is tangible. Um, it's, it's like massive report, there's like thousands of pages, but this line for me is the one that speaks to me the most. And it is that the goal of reconciliation is to restore what must be restored repair what must be repaired and return what must be returned. And so when I think about relationships and knowledge systems and land and traditional knowledges, things that were eroded by the colonial education system of the Indian residential schools, the colonization of this land, the, the Indian Act, which has forbidden people from passing on their culture and traditions, to me, that's what we need to be restored, repaired and returned. And this photo that you see um, is a dear friend of mine, the late John Prosper. I taught many of his children. This is his grandson next to him. And this was a day we, we had a grandfather's tea after making paddles. We made canoe paddles with kids as a grade eight show me your math project. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, but we invited the grandfathers in because we'd found a story about where they were all out canoe racing. And uh, they were so excited to come in and talk to the kids about the paddles that they had made. And the kids were excited to tell them all their stories. And um, John said, it's so great that you're able to do this because when we were kids, we weren't allowed to do this. And I thought, what do you mean you weren't allowed to do it, right? Like you weren't able to do it. And I thought, oh, you know, colonization. But it was actually illegal for indigenous people when John was a kid um, for them to pass on their culture and traditions, right? There was the, what, what's called the potlatch ban and, and it was illegal according to the Indian Act for indigenous people to practice their culture and traditions when he was young. He just passed away last year. So really a whole, a whole lot of this um, work began with a conversation with the late Diane Tony and uh, Dave Wagner, uh, my colleague, he was my, my PhD supervisor, he and I at the time, were talking with elders 
about ethnomathematics for uh, a grant I was working on for him. Um, it was part of the Atlantic Regional Crystal Grant. Some of you may remember the NSERC Crystal Grants. Um, and so we were, we were actually looking for ethnomathematics, the math that communities do every day in their everyday practice. And Diane, who made this quill box that you see, she said to me, you know, Lisa, whenever I need to make the ring to go around the box, so you can see she starts with a circle. Um, and so this is birch bark. And then she would make a ring to fit around the birch bark and then start to weave the porcupine quills in and around this. And she said, to make the ring, I just measure three times across the circle and I add a thumb width and it makes a perfect ring every time. And I, of course, got very excited and I said, that's pie. And she said, no, it's common sense. An elder taught me that when I was learning how to make baskets. And what I realized is this was knowledge that was passed down to her over time. Um, it was not knowledge that came from school books or uh, Greek mathematicians. There was a need to understand the relationship between the circumference and the diameter of the circle because you wanted your strip to be long enough without waste. So it needed to be long enough that there'd be just a little bit of overlap so you could fasten it together, but that you didn't have to end up cutting off a lot because then that would be wasteful, right? And this notion of enough is really fundamentally important in Indigenous cultures to take what you need. Um, Dibiach is the word in Mi'kma. And so this idea of enough um, is rooted in this relationship. I want to figure out how much I need to go around the circle without waste. And so this relationship was known. It was three times across and a thumb width. And so we actually use this um, with, with students. There's a link here. I will paste this link in the chat box if you want to play while I talk. I'm just going to try and copy this if I can. Hang on, I'm going to escape. Ah, hang on. There we go. I'll copy. Um, I will paste it in the chat box. Um, and if you want, there you go, Craig, you can have that. It's a great uh, investigation. Um, so it's done as a Desmos activity now. <laughs> um, and, and so what we do is we actually get students to, um, to build circles, to draw circles and to use some string or yarn, or I use rolls of paper um, and, and to actually measure and, and to measure the distance across the circle and the length of the strip that went around the circle. Um, it's great with kids who don't know pi because they think it's magic that it works every time. It's really kind of fun. Um, I remember doing it with a group of grade sixes one day just as a way to pass some time. And, and they were just like so blown away that it didn't matter, you know, it always worked. And of course it doesn't always work because eventually your circle can get really big. But what's interesting is we also did a drum making um, show me your math project where an elder taught us that it was three times across and a little bit more. And when it's bigger, it's a hand width, right? Um, and so we actually talk about this known relationship. And so that Desmos activity um, is there for you if you want to use it with your students. Um, and uh, it's um, all designed with the story and everything. There's a little video in there and all that. Um, but what this really inspired was a conversation that Dave and I had about how interesting these, these conversations were with the elders and how it shouldn't be us actually having these conversations that it should be the kids um, in schools. And so we started a program that ran from 2007 until about 2017 um, called Show Me Your Math. And we invited children in the communities to have those conversations with elders and knowledge keepers and tradespeople or craftspeople, people who had used not that mathematical knowledge in their everyday lives. And we used to have these big math fairs. It was really fun. You, you, you haven't lived until you've seen 200 kids talking about math in a gym. It's, it's quite fun. Um, there, that's what it looks like. <laughs> there you go. That's a couple of pictures from a while back. I think that was like 2012 or 2013 um, at the math fair. 
And so what we noticed when we started to talk to kids and teachers and community members about Show Me Your Math is that there was a sense of wholeness that came. So, you know, kids weren't learning about somebody else's culture, they were learning about their own, right? And there was that cultural synthesis that's so often missing in math class. Um, there was also this intergenerational transmission of knowledge. And when I think about that returning, repairing and restoring, it is, you know, so much a, of the residential school program broke that intergenerational transmission of knowledge. And so this program really brought that back together and centered that intergenerational transmission of knowledge as well. Um, and what eventually evolved from this is what still goes on in a lot of schools today, which is things like inquiry-based projects that focus on doing something and learning math and other subjects while you're doing it. So, you know, we have schools that do, as I say, drum making, there's the paddle making photo. Um, we have some schools that tap maple syrup trees. We've had um, schools make medicine pouches and um, moccasins and shawls and lots of things. And so part of what's come out of the Show Me Your Math, we haven't really done it in a few years, although, um, we're trying to scheme a way to get it back going again. Um, but what has come out of it is that in the MK schools, it's pretty commonplace now to see teachers um, doing inquiry-based tasks that focus on culture, that center cultural practices and cultural artifacts and cultural knowledges um, to learn mathematics. Uh, I frequently get messages or calls or comments to, to look for ideas. Not that long ago, we did some uh, quill work projects with a school, actually a public school in Halifax. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been really interesting. There's also been some really interesting knowledge that came out of it. Um, these are, these are two women. This is Caroline Gould um, and uh, Margaret Johnson, who was affectionately known as Dr. Granny. And they were basket makers. But what I learned is they were actually birch bark biters. And I found an article called, I'm the last one who can do this. And it was after I had had a conversation with an elder who said, you know, when I was a little girl, uh, my mom used to ask us to fold, or she'd peel thin strips of bark off the logs and ask us if we could fold them and bite shapes into them. And of course I got really excited. I had seen birch bark biting before, but I didn't know it was something done in Mi'kmaq territory. And um, the elder said to me, yeah, no, no, you should go learn about it, <laughs> which is like, orders to go do research. Um, and I did, and I'm reading this article and it in the second page of the article, it says Dr. Margaret Johnson um, from Escazoni was someone who was known to be a birch bark biter, but also recounted that she thought she was one of the last people who could do it in her community, um, which is where the title of the article came from. And, and then at the bottom, it said, and her sister in another community was also known to be a birch bark biter. And I knew exactly who that was because I, I knew that would, would have been Caroline. And um, unfortunately they had both passed away by the time I found this article. But we decided to start doing birch bark biting in the schools. And, and I, you know, oftentimes people will look at a birch bark biting and, and they'll, they'll look for lines of symmetry or, you know, what have you. But what, what we really noticed is that the mathematics happens in the doing and the creating. Um, if you want to make a circle, you really need to think about, you know, the points that are equidistant from the center. Uh, there was one young fellow who was trying really hard to make an eight point star and he finally figured it out. And he would, he really had to think about the angles and he had to visualize. And so there's a lot of mathematics that happens in the creating. And oftentimes when I show these, rather than saying where the lines of symmetry, I'll say to people, where do you think they folded it? And what do you think they bit, right? So that it focuses on the process and not on the product. Um, but the thing that came out of this um, was, was comments like this. I remember Auntie Caroline doing that in the basket shop. And so it was this remembering, it was this returning of a memory, right? And every time I've done birch bark biting in schools, what happens is stories come out, stories emerge. So it's not just about the mathematics. There's tons of mathematical thinking that goes into doing it there, but there's also this remembering that happens. There's a, a storytelling aspect to it always. And so these that we've done and, and now we're, what I've done in recent years is I have a program called Connecting Math to Our Lives and Communities, 
Um, it's funded through uh, NSERC, Promo Science. And um, we basically try to do these things as an after school program now. So we have an after school program um, right now. It's sort of stalled by COVID. This month, though, we're having a, a math and art and nature contest on Facebook for kids to submit things. Um, but we do bring in a lot of these ideas into, um, into the Connecting Math to Our Lives and Communities piece um, that is an extension of the Show Me Your Math program. And there we also make math matter for kids. So we, we, don't, we, we do some math, traditional math things here in this, this image at the top, um, this one. Whoops, let me go back. I'm trying to draw with my pen here and it's not working. There we go. So this image at the top, you'll see um, kids playing Waltus, which is a traditional Mi'kmaq game that is very mathematical. And uh, Kyla has actually written a, a book for mathology about Waltus. Um, and so this, this is a game that's commonly played in schools. It's, it's a very rich mathematical game. So we do things like this where it honors traditional knowledge, but we also um, try to examine issues like environmental racism or water insecurity in First Nations communities. This water came from one of our Connecting Math to Our Lives in communities. Um, this was the tap water in their community. Um, one we're working on right now is, is the notion of, of a moderate livelihood fishery, which is so crucial um, for Mi'kmaq communities right now. Um, this infographic was created uh, based on some data one of our St. of X students actually came up with. And what you see here is that this is the non-Indigenous commercial fishery. So 390,000 traps. Um, the, these little lobsters right here represent the moderate livelihood fishery. Um, some of you may have witnessed the violence that was enacted on these fishers uh, trying to earn a moderate livelihood. And they're now being accused of, of uh, destroying the stocks. So this is a case where mathematics and proportional reasoning in particular can really help us to understand a story. So we bring some of those things into um, what we're doing now, both in the connecting math to our lives and communities and some of the work we're doing with schools. Um, and so those things are all sort of equity, very explicitly equity, social justice focused issues. Um, but for me, that's not enough. And what I learned in my, in my PhD is that um, the idea that ethnomathematical investigations alone are not sufficient. It's good for kids to see that their elders were mathematicians too. It's good for them to recognize that there's this knowledge base that has been there. It's good for them to learn the power of mathematics to solve community problems. But there's also a piece of coming to understand mathematics in your own ways of knowing. And so the next little bit that I'm gonna talk about is, is mathematics that's rooted in Olnuidasim or Mi'kmaq ways of knowing. Um, and so, so it's moving beyond kind of the ethno-mathematical or culturally based into something that focuses more on, that Kyla man, you can't trust her. Um, <laughs> something that focuses more on um, on the culture, the language, the ways of knowing, the epistemology of Mi'kmaq people. And so um, I did a process during my, my uh, PhD called Maui Ganu Demadimk, which means coming together to learn together. And this is how I engaged in my research. Uh, this word was given to me by the late Grand Chief Ben Silliboy, and uh, it, it really guided my, my doctoral work, but I can honestly say it guides my life. Um, the notion that when we come together, we all have things we can share and we all have things we can learn. And so coming together to learn together has really um, been my philosophy for how I go about this work. Um, and, and this model emerged out of my doctoral work. Um, really what it shows is that this ethnomathematical stuff that I've been talking about, it's this piece right here. Um, and so you can see this, you know, the show me your math, the, the ethnomathematics, the connecting to culture, but this is a small piece of a big picture. And when I was talking with teachers and elders, what kept coming up over and over again were, were some of the values, things like 
the idea that when I would ask a how much or how many question and elders would say, oh, Dibiach, oh, Dibiach, oh, Dibiach, Dibiach just means enough, right? And so this value of spatial reasoning was really um, inherent, like thinking in, in, in terms of space rather than quantity. Um, and also when I asked about number, because there's this complex number system, like when I was learning to count in Mi'gma, people were like, well, what are you counting? <laughs> it's like, what do you mean? What am I counting? Right? So like uh, animate words are, are conjugated different than animate, inanimate objects. They're counted differently. Um, I one time was looking at a Mi'kmaq dictionary for the right spelling of the word three in Mi'kmaq and I found 27 different words for three. And there were things like three animate cylindrical objects, three animate inanimate cylindrical objects, three animate spherical objects, three inanimate spherical objects, three animate sheet-like objects, three inanimate sheet. So it went on and on, right? And I'm like, okay, so there's a complex counting, but whenever I ask a question, I get a spatial answer. And so what I was told by one elder is that, you know, enough is for survival. So this spatial reasoning piece is really important for survival. And number is more for play, right? And so there's lots of games like Waltus that have really sophisticated concepts of number in them. So this notion of kind of playing with number is something that I play with in my work. Also the really importance of, of spatial reasoning and, and being able to hold math in your hand. But a big piece that has really come out of my work is the notion of language. And so the importance of learning from language um, and really taking to heart what we can learn from indigenous languages. And so uh, in math, we have this tendency to turn everything into a noun. Um, so we take the act of joining two sets, we call it addition, or we say, find the sum of the three consecutive numbers or something, right? Or we, you know, my, my favorite one is um, the slope is the ratio of the change in the y value to the change in the x value. That's like a whole lot of noun. That's a whole lot of things when it's really like a description of how a graph is increasing or decreasing, right? So it's really a, it's a, a description of movement that has been nominalized into a, a, you know, a thing and a thing in relation to another thing. And so this whole nominalization flies in the face of Mi'kmaq, which is a verb-based language. And all indigenous languages in Canada are verb-based. Um, Leroy Little Bear talks about how they, they, they honor flux and flow and movement. And so indigenous languages capture this verb-based idea, this idea that, that things are in motion. And so for me, this has been kind of the biggest understanding, um, you know, learning the language was something I did out of respect for the community, um, but it became the thing that has shaped my understanding of mathematics the most. And so this notion that verbing math um, is really important. And so the work that, oh, here, here's an example. Here's an example of nominalization versus verbification. So in nominalization, what we do is we take a quadratic function and we apply a vertical translation, a horizontal translation, a stretch or a reflection. But what we're really doing is moving it side to side, up and down and flipping it over, making it skinnier, making it wider, right? It's all about action. And, and thank goodness for dynamic graphing software like Desmos, because now we can put in sliders and play around with this and see the action in place. Um, but we label these as things instead of as processes or actions, right? And so for me, I'm really striving to, to verb my mathematics. And we, we have a program right now that we're, we're working on um, in MK schools and with some public schools. We call it moving achievement together holistically. And we're drawing all of this stuff that came from the doctoral work, um, these ideas that are rooted in Oluwi Dasim for our Mi'kmaq ways of knowing. And we're working alongside teachers and right now math coaches in one of the regional centers um, to help them to understand some of these and to think about what it means for task design or we design tasks and we actually go out into, into the classrooms and we work with kids. Um, <laughs> this photo right here, you'll see this is me. Uh, this is Kyla. Uh, this is my colleague Evan and uh, my colleague Alan. Um, and uh, <laughs> 
we are the math spies, according to Joyce, who is one of the students um, who wrote that math is everywhere. And so she gave us this photo one day when we were in doing drawings with kids and um, that uh, that was interesting in and of itself. I don't have any examples of the drawings tonight, but uh, one of the things that was really interesting is the kids were all happy and excited. And uh, we didn't notice that until we took the drawings to a CMESG uh, gallery walk and people were like, did you notice that all the kids are happy? <laughs> but uh, I just know all the kids are happy in that school anyway. Um, but what we're really doing is working on these ideas around verbing and spatializing mathematics um, and, and seeing how it works. So I wanna give you some examples of what that looks like. So a big thing uh, with verbing is just really focusing on change and motion. Like, so how can I, how can I make it how do I, how did, does it get created? How is it forming? Um, questions like that. So what we're really doing, and I'm drawing a lot actually from John Mason and Watson and others work right now around structure and structuring. And the idea that, that there is this kind of emerging structure that comes when we play with building and creating. And so we're really working on building and creating and, um, and allowing the structure to emerge. And we're gonna look at a few activities um, that hopefully will bring that to, to light. Um, the other big thing is this spatial reasoning. Like, and so whenever I'm introducing a task, I always think particularly a number task, I think about linear set and area models, or is there a way I can hold it in my hand? And so we do a lot of work with um, linear set and area models and always thinking as we're planning, like how can I represent this in different ways? Um, a big part of it is that experience, right? Building it hands-on. And we really try to avoid heavy language at the beginning. Uh, we have this belief that when we figure it out, we name it. And so we don't actually introduce a lot of formal mathematical language until kids begin to see that emerging structure. And then we give them the language to name it, right? The way mathematicians do. Um, so let, let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's, here's a set of activities. I'm gonna give you, give you these links. Oops, let me stop using my pen. I'm just gonna escape out of here and I'm gonna actually give you these links so you can go and play with some of these things. Um, it's easier to copy the links. So this one is for sets of and uh, there is a little polypad activity that you can do there. And the idea with this, I'm actually going to open that polypad activity. Uh, you can use the spinners or the dice. So if we only want up to six times six, we'll use the dice. We're going to randomize that. Um, and we're going to actually build either six sets of five or five sets of six. And we can take and duplicate these little suckers and just start putting them into here. And so this is an example of the kinds of things I'm going to build five sets of six. So I'm going to do oops, shift. I like to cheat by duplicating things. Um, oops, this is the one thing I don't like about polypad is stuff goes in behind anyway. So the idea is that you can actually build the five sets of six um, and then count it up. Okay, so that's one, one of the activities that we've done. So it's the notion that through play, you're building sets and you're beginning to understand a concept of round um, multiplication. We also do it with the 10 frames. So here's another one that actually has 10 frames. So I'll paste that in the chat box as well. Um, the nice thing about doing it with 10 frames is it brings structure. And so you can see here when we build five sets of six, um, we can see the fives and the ones, right? And so building sixes on a 10 frame begins to impose structure on it. Um, we also do jump solve, so rows are linear. Um, so here's one version. There's actually two versions of the, the jump solve or length solve. Uh, I'll paste those in here as well. Um, and, and feel free to go and play. So here's one, instead of jumping on a number line, what we're actually doing is um, using the Cuisenaire rods. And so again, we can roll 
the dice and I can do four or five. So I'm gonna go four lengths of five. You can pull up the tools too, just to, I just find it easier to just copy them, but you can go grab the tools and pull them out. Okay. And, and what's really neat is kids can also do five fours and we can have some conversation about whether or not you get the same length because kids in grade three don't know multiplication is commutative. It's very exciting when they figure it out. Um, so these, you can do jumps on a number line. All these activities are there if you wanna play with them. Um, and then we also have one more where we build rows. So what you see here is that we're doing set models, linear models and area models um, with students. And so we want kids to just play. We don't actually use the word multiplication at all. We're just getting them to play and to build. What happens when I build three sets of two? What happens when I build two sets of four? What happens when I build you know, four sets of five? What happens when I take five jumps of two on the number line? What happens when I build five lengths of two? And so they're doing this over and over again in centers and really active hands-on. So it's not about what's the answer, it's about what happens when I'm creating these things. And so it's really rooted in that action and that creation. And what's really interesting is that, you know, kids begin to um, see some neat things. I'm gonna play this video for you. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Can you hear that? No, okay, hang on. I'll, I'll just maybe narrate over it because he's saying six rows and then four rows. I want you to just watch his hands. And then he says 24. And then he's saying six and six and 12 more is 24. And, and so what's really interesting is I love the way he's kind of like making sense of the area model with his gestures. I saw Susan in here, she'll like that one. Um, <laughs> So I really like the way he makes sense of his gesture, like through gesturing, and he's really trying to make sense of that area model. Um, I, and, and then we came in um, later after they'd done a series of these centers and we introduced story problems that involve sets and rows and jumps. And you can see they had access to all kinds of materials um, and they were really, really excited and really engaged in doing this. And, and what happened was students started to say, well, I just built this four times and I built this three times and I built that two times. And then one little girl goes, wait a minute, this is just times, right? And then I was like, okay, now I can introduce the word multiplication because I'm winning now, right? It, it, it was like, this sets up rows of jumps up stuff. It's just times. <laughs> and, and so then we could use that word and we could own that word and we could name it, right? Um, the little girl in this picture here, uh, she had brought five sets of two together like this. Um, and then she realized that it was also two sets of five. And so this photo that you see is, is the look on a child's face when they discover multiplication is commutative, right? And I mean, you get that kind of joy over multiplication being commutative in your grade three class and you call that a win, I'm telling you. You call it a win. <laughs> so, what was really interesting with this class is we actually went back in the following year and we're working with them in grade four and they were supposed to be doing classifications of numbers. And they had been really struggling. Their teachers like, you know, they don't know odds and evens, which makes complete sense to me that they don't know in grade four because we do it like one day in grade two and then just expect them to know it later. Anyway, that's the whole <laughs> commentary on the curriculum. Um, so I, we put square color tiles out on the tables and we said, you know, tell us if, if, if these are yeses or no. So if you can organize it in two equal rows, say yes. If you, can, if you can't, say no, right? So eight, that's a yes, nine, that's a no, right? And so what they did is they started to build these and they were having debates because sometimes they'd take a number like 21 and organize it into three rows of seven and then be like, no, no, she said two rows, right? And so, so they were beginning to understand which ones were yeses and which ones were noes. And then we introduced the language of odd and even. And then we introduced some bigger numbers. And so we were talking in particular about 132. 
And, and we got some really interesting uh, reasoning. And you can see here a little bit, one little guy saying, well, two times five is 10, right? So all your tens are even because they're always two times five and however many of them have, it's still just tens. And then, and then he was like, and if you multiply that by five, you get 50 and 50 times two is a hundred and a hundred's even. So his argument was really that you really only need to pay attention to the ones digit, right? These are grade fours. <laughs> and, and they were also making conjectures like, hey, if you add two odds, you get an even because like you can put them together and those ones are going to take care of each other. And, you know, if you add two evens, you get an even. But if you add an odd and an even, you're going to get an odd. These were the kinds of conversations that were happening from this one simple question of saying, can you organize this into two equal rows? And so we got some really interesting things. Um, then they wanted to talk about proving that one, three, five, seven, and nine were always odd and <laughs> that the others were even. So they were building that. Um, but what really happened is there's lots of rich conversation coming out of this. So, so this is my goal always is to begin with like a simple task where kids can build it, right? So maybe it's building sets on a 10 frame. Um, you know, and as you can see, when we start to build that, the spatial aspect of it too, when we really pay attention to the structure, um, when we look at seven on a 10 frame, we see five and two. And so giving kids that strategy, you know, for me, I, I've been doing 10 frame multiplication with kids for a while. And, you know, probably 15 years ago now, I was in a resource room with a little guy who came in and he said, I can only do the twos. My teacher says I can only do the twos. And he had a worksheet where he had to do his twos facts for multiplication. And so I was building things like this for him and he was able to calculate when he could visually see four sets of six or four sets of seven, but still had this, this idea that all he could do was the twos. And so that's a real dangerous thing. If we don't provide children the opportunity to actually bring their own ways of knowing to mathematics, they often develop limiting ideas about who they are as mathematicians. Um, same thing with the nines. I love the nines on the 10 frame because you can really see it's 10 minus a set. So if I have to do, you know, six times nine, it's 60 minus six or seven times nine is 70 minus seven. Um, and, and of course, one of my favorite things to do with sets also is to um, do some multiplication. Uh, so I'm going to share this with you as well. I'm going to pause. I'm going to share this link. Uh, just both of them. I'll share both of them. I'd like you to click on the first one. And this is my, my favorite representation for integers called the bucket of zero. And this is really drawing from the visual spatial aspect, um, the concrete, hold it in your hand, and the idea of building and verbing. And so in this exploration, what we're doing is we're either adding to or taking from the bucket and we're using the integer tiles um, from algebra. So we're using the, uh, the algebra tiles, the positive one and negative one. And so if I have to add two sets of positive four to the bucket, you know, I can just add to the bucket one, two, three, four. I can double that because like to clone things. So when I add two sets of positive four to the bucket, you know, I get positive eight. I'm just going to set my bucket back to zero. If I were to add three sets of negative two to the bucket, there's a set of negative two. There's another set of negative two. One more set of negative two. All of this is zero. So now my bucket is negative six. And it's, it makes me happy, right? Uh, I'm going to take that out, set my bucket back to zero. <clears throat> and now I want to start taking out sets. So remove four sets of positive three. Okay, so there's positive three. I'm going to take that out. There's positive three. I'm going to take that out. I'm do here too. There's positive three. Take that out. There's positive three, take that out. Now the value of my bucket becomes negative 12. I'm gonna put those back, put those back. 
put those back. I love the bucket of zero. It makes me super excited. This, by the way, came out of desperation to teach multiplication of integers in a way that made sense. So now if I need to remove five sets of negative two from the bucket, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, and five. I can see when I remove five sets of negative two from the bucket, the value in the bucket becomes positive 10 because when I take away negatives, I leave behind their positive partners. And that is why a negative times a negative is a positive. And so this for me is yet another example of the idea of verbing math. It's the idea of creating and building, focusing on the action and the process um, in a way that actually makes sense for students. And so then of course, I ask students to write this in a mathematical language. So if I have to write, remove five sets of negative two, that really would be written this way. And what's left behind is positive 10, right? Remove four sets of positive three and what's left behind is negative. 12. Okay, so this is, you know, up here, this was add two sets of positive four. So um, feel free to grab this link, log into Polypad and save it and use it with your own students. <laughs> um, these are, 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 you can save them in your library, you can make copies. And when you share them, like I shared it with you, you don't get my copy, you get your own in, individual copy. Um, do the same thing with uh, the division. Again, this one, and we, we actually look at both uh, models of division. So if I wanted to make the bucket worth positive 12 using sets of positive two, I would add six sets. Um, or if I wanted to make the bucket worth positive 12, adding six equal groups, I would add groups of positive two. And so here again, we start to explore, like how can I make the bucket worth minus 15 using sets of positive three. Well, I need to take sets of positive three out of the bucket five times in order to get it to be negative 15. Or another way is to think, you know, how could I make the bucket worth positive 10 by adding five equal groups? What would the size of the groups be? And then we imagine them going in. So this is an exploration that we do. Nat Banting and I are actually writing a paper about this right now because he used it with his pre-service teachers and I've used it with mine a lot. Um, <laughs> and um, it's a nice, I built this this year because I was teaching online and it's a nice little way of exploring the idea of multiplication and division of integers. And so again, these are things that I, I, I think are rooted in, they don't look like indigenous math but they're rooted in these ideas of action and process and spatial reasoning, right? That are so important in, um, in, in Olnui Dasink, Mi'kmaq ways of knowing. And so, um, you know, a big part is like, just again, playing with things like Cuisinair rods and we do that for equivalence. Like, you know, if we can make same length trains, we often teach equivalence as balance, but I really like same length because that makes more sense to some kids. And if I can build the same length with nine and five as six and eight, then that tells me those are equivalent. Um, you know, and, the, and that leads into things with multiplication and division using the Cuisinair rods. And for me, you know, that's a carry right through to using strip diagrams or double number lines to solve equations in middle school. Um, I do a lot of work with area models. <laughs> My students tell me that I'm obsessed with area models, which is probably true. Um, really, you know, playing around with arrays um, and areas and really trying to get kids to think in terms of area. But one of the things for me, really just working with area for multi-digit calculations and, you know, even as we get higher, just making little boxes to kind of break it up into area to really understand that, um, 
distributive property. For me, it's really been about helping students to, to really think about how we partition mathematics and how we can break things apart, multiply the parts, put them back together. Um, and I, I taught high school kids who, who used area model a lot because they had done a lot of algebra tile work. And it was such a good go-to for them that I realized that it was so important for them to have it. Um, even things like having and doubling, you know, you can fold a piece of paper in half. If I have to do 12 by 15, if I cut it in half, then I can do six by 30. Um, again, those can be shown with area models and they of course work really well for multiplication of fractions. Um, and even things like approximating square roots, I like to use an area model. So, you know, we, we know that the square root of 25 is five because I can build a square that has side length five. But if I have to find the square root of something like 12, I can build the area model. Um, I know that nine is the closest perfect square I can get. And then I've got these three little ones that I have to split up. And so, if I put half on each side, I'd have a little bit missing in the corner here. So I know that the square root of 12 is a little bit less than 3.5. And actually, if you slice these into tenths and started to put them along the sides so that you'd have four tenths on each side, it, you'd, you'd have a little bit extra. So you'd actually could show that um, it's somewhere between 3.4 and 3.5, which is a nice way to help kids understand square roots. Um, and of course, then it builds into algebra tiles. And the thing for me really was the day in my grade 12 class, when I put a, an equation in standard form up on the board, and I said, next week, we're going to take these kinds of quadratic equations and turn them back into transformational form. Um, and I, I said to my students in the two minutes that were remaining in class, how would you do that? You might want to think about how you do that. And they had an answer for me in about 30 seconds. And I said, what did you do? And they said, we drew a picture, right? They used an area model to complete the square. Um, and so uh, that really made me a big believer in the importance of these visual models. Um, another little project that we're working on right now, there's Kyla, since she doesn't have her camera on. Um, <laughs> another little project that we're working on, although I think she might've disappeared again, uh, is, um, a, a holistic math assessment with MK. So we have this little bear, her name's Aliette. And these are her friends. This is Andale and Gullalin and Bictol is not in this picture, but he's a beaver. Um, and they're characters in our treaty education books, but also in our math program um, where Aliette is the main character and we've been designing activities. Um, we actually have an app and we have a uh, holistic assessment app, but we have a second app uh, in development right now with um, math activities for grade one. And uh, so, you know, we design little activities that we test out with the kids in the schools, things like, you know, they go fishing and this is a story from one of the treaty ed books that they go fishing and they're catching, catching salmon and trout. And uh, so doing some partitioning activities, you know, we've developed learning centers where the characters really factor into, um, all of the activities. And so we're working really hard to make sure um, <clears throat> that kids are learning math in ways that, that feel, feel at home. You can look at, if I go back to this picture, you can really look, they, these images were designed to look like Nova Scotia, to look like the land and the territory here. And so um, it's been a, a fun project as well. Um, and, you know, you, you see it in the joy in the kids' faces. This is a grade one class that I work in quite often. Um, and the kids are playing their own version of Waltus. You can see uh, the scaled back version. It is not a, a wooden bowl and, and bone dice. It is some two colored counters and some paper plates and some popsicle sticks. Um, but they're learning how to, uh, to play Waltus and they're, they're using their skip counting as they do it. Um, this was sent to me by the grade one teacher one night. I was, <laughs> I, I was looking on Facebook and all the grade one parents were talking about how much fun grade one homework was. And uh, as it turned out, they were all playing Waltus. And I was like, it's not very often you see grade one math homework trending on Twit on Facebook. Um, but um, for me, these, these are the things that we're doing around reconciliation. And I just wanna <coughs> have this one last photo. Um, I began with the story of, of my first grade sevens and, and their 
their comments about Shuby School. And I end with this, which is a monument outside the school in Wagoma right now. These are two good friends of mine, uh, Tiny and Deuce, um, who are folks that I've worked with uh, for decades. And um, this monument was the first of its kind in Canada. It's in Wagoma First Nation outside the school. Um, and it is a monument to residential school survivors and it was developed and designed by their survivors group. And at the top it says Duke up, which means it will never happen again. And on the monument are the names of all the residential school survivors from the community, both living and deceased. Um, and there's a little passage here from Rita Joe's poem, I Lost My Talk. Rita Joe is one of the members of this community who is on the monument. And I share this because this is something that sits outside the school as a way to remind the kids um, of their strength, of their resilience, of their survival. There are biographies of most of the, the folks on this in the schools, they line the walls. And over here off screen where you can't see, there's a bench there. So you can go outside and have a class at that monument. Um, and to me, it's an indication of kind of the resilience and the survival and where we're going um, with healing in, um, and, and noticing and recognizing that mathematics and mathematics educa education has a role to play in that. And I'm gonna stop there and invite questions. Comments. I talked longer than I thought. Susan? I think I saw um, your... I'm just applauding. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Vanessa and uh, Matt, or Mathilde, sorry. Uh, same thing for me. I'm, I'm, I'm also clapping. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just mixing up uh, applauding and raising hands. <laughs> Well, I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Lisa. This was, uh, we came together and we learned together. Uh, it was, uh, it was really rich. It was really awesome. You can also write your questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable. Or... Yep. I'm open to questions. Craig. Craig has a question. Craig was my student. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have a question, but I, I wanted to make a comment. Like all of these things that that we're doing, like the exploration pieces and making sure that we're we're doing those pieces before we provide information is something you definitely taught me and that I've been using since I've graduated, thank God. But <laughs> I think the most interesting or the best thing that I've gotten from this PD is I didn't know what to call it. Like I don't, I'm like, what do we, yeah, it's exploration, but what is it? So I think the biggest thing that I got out of this was the verbing math. Yeah. I'm like I wrote it down in capital letters. I'm like, this is what, we need to be doing this is what mm -hmm. this sums it up in two words right exactly yeah. we need to be doing more and and uh exploring more than just necessarily you know playing with the numbers and focusing on the symbolic all the time yeah yeah i, I mean the verbing the, yeah the verbing piece for me that was that was my biggest learning from from working and learning the language it was like yeah i just and my kids used to say to me like you explain things different than other teachers. And I didn't quite know what that meant, but then I realized it was because I would listen to how they were talking and then I would model that back to them. So I really began to adopt the verb and kind of, just because that's the way I am, I adopt the ways of speaking of whomever I'm speaking to. It's a bad habit really, but also beneficial at times. And that really became for me like a real insight into how, like how this all worked, right? And, and one of the things, as I've shared this over the years, particularly with my colleagues in CMESG, some of whom are here, um, mathematicians will say to me, that's what we do, right? We actually verb math. We, figure, we play around, we figure it out. When we figure it out, we name it. And we name it so we can do new things with it. And so for me, that's been a really big piece of, of kind of understanding that it's probably better for all kids. Um, but it's essential for Indigenous kids, right? Because that verb-based language structure. It's lovely to see you, Craig. I miss your face. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> agreed. <laughs>
Um, uh, Alyssa. Hi. Uh, Hi. I, just, I have first a question about what are the rules of that Waltus game, if you have a link. Um, that or... There are there are old documents um, that exist somewhere around the rules. You can find some things online. CBC did a piece on it, and they even have a yeah. little animated one. Um, let me see if I can find that. In I, I found the CBC piece, I think. Yeah. It's an so, ancient Mi'kmaq game of Waltus makes a comeback. Is that the one that... <laughs> Yeah, that, that would be the one that that's okay. going to give you your best insight. There's probably some other things, um, but but really you you have to learn from an elder. But I would recommend the mathology book mathology. because it teaches you the basics. Um, it, it's a little bit different than how you would play like the full version of the game because mm -hmm. it's modified for little kids um, mm -hmm. and was done with elder approval. Um, but basically the way you play the first round is you collect sticks. So if you get five up or six up or five down or six down, you get points. Um, mm -hmm. And it's usually three sticks each time. But then there's also like three grandmothers and a grandfather or three old ladies and an old man who you have to collect and you have to get so many in a row. And I honestly, I, I've been, I always sit with an elder to play the game because I truly haven't figured out the rules yet. <laughs> okay. But, it was great that photo that I showed, we were having one of our math outreach days um, where we brought all the kids together. And one of the little girls who came who was a daughter of one of my former students actually knew how to count because her grandfather had taught her how to count. And so she did the counting for us, it was great. Um, but uh, yeah, I wish Kyla was still here because I think she would be able to help you out more than I can, but yeah. That's okay. I, I also like the polypad thing. So I'm gonna copy those links down because yes, I like, I like inventing how to explain sort of complex topics. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's, that's what we spend a lot of our time doing is trying to figure out how can we, how can we make this concept emerge through play um, <laughs> in a way that it's actually gonna get us to where we need to be without, yeah. So. Yeah, we, we did some uh, fun games like this, like trying to see if we could teach uh, grade four and up like how to do modular arithmetic and mm -hmm. we had essentially done this like sorting the integers into buckets based on properties that they yeah. have and they actually had a lot of fun with it I mean lots of them when they were way younger they, they had fun doing it but they didn't really know what was mm -hmm. the point but the older yeah. students were like oh I get it now yeah. it makes more sense yeah that's awesome uh, yeah. anyway I like uh, to make those tangible connections for sure yeah so I, I just also wanted to make the comment where you're saying about the verbing thing. This is something mm -hmm. that we do and we're trying to explain like calculus too. Mm -hmm. So it's sort yeah. of weird that like, you're, you're right, we do, we do give everything a name and that's fine. But if you're trying to explain what is a limit, you're explaining the change and, and that sort of thing. So yeah. it's kind of Yeah, and, and this, was always, this was always my frustration with slope. And like, I used to sing slope is rise over run to the tune of band on the run in my grade 10 class, like rise over run, rise over run. And it was like, but as soon as I said, how is this graph changing? Or how do I make it? How do I get from one point to the next? Suddenly they could explain it. But when I asked what was the slope, it was like, whew. And, yeah. and what you what you realize is if kids can get through all that nominalized naming, labeling stuff, they actually get to talk in verbs again. But by the time they get to talk in verbs, most of them haven't gotten there, right? They've been, mm -hmm. they've either walked away from mathematics because it hasn't been a welcoming space or they haven't been successful in it and have decided to go in other routes, right? Like. No, yeah, that's, that's very true because yeah. I, I mean, at least at the level of like university education, you you are relying on them knowing those names, but you still play a lot more with describing change and this is what you do, you play with stuff, right? So it's kind of, anyway, I yeah. just, I thought that was a very cool yeah. insight, Thanks. so yeah. thank you. Thanks, no problem. Craig has his hand up again. Yeah, I was just gonna make a comment too, like the same thing, like I, when I first got into the education program at St. of X, I had no intentions of ever teaching math. I did it to get into the program. I took 18 credits and because of Lisa, uh, you know, and all of these <laughs> methods that she's going through it and looking back and, you know, it, she changed my whole outlook on math. He's a math coach now. 
It, well, I'm not a coach. I, oh, I'm a, yeah. Our coach is lead. in the meeting though, but. Lead, math <laughs> lead, is that what you do? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure, basically. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like it's the same thing, talking about that space where, you know, you, you want, you find yourself in a space where it's like, I'm like, I, I'm good at the symbolic part. Like I, I'm okay at it, but am I that good that I can, you know, really pursue this? And I'm like, no, not really. Right. And then when, you know, all of a sudden show up and take your two methods courses and then I'm like, oh, this is math. Like this is actually a lot, makes a lot more sense. And it makes a lot more sense to teach it that. Right. So that yeah. way too. So I just want to give you a little bit of credit too, for sure. Because like I said, if I hadn't had those courses, I had a lot of your guidance then. I probably wouldn't be teaching math. Thank you. So thank you. That warms my heart. <laughs> Hello. Can you guys hear Hi. Me? Hi. How are you? Not too bad. How are you? Good. I actually wanted to share um, a comment that one of my students made last time, uh, last semester when we came to your talk um, within the CMS series as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I brought my, I, I don't know if you remembered, but she literally reiterated that comment to me like three times throughout the semester after the talk. <laughs> and I think it just, it like stuck with me. Um, so I was teaching math elementary teachers and I, and Lisa's seminar fell incredibly conveniently within my <laughs> lecture slot. So I just told my students that I'm canceling my lecture and we're just going to Lisa's seminar. And one of them, because quite a few of them were sort of mature students coming back for like a second degree or something, right? And one of them did an anthropology degree before with the focus on um, indigenous cultures in British Columbia, right? And, uh, and the comment that she made was, like, I think she actually spoke about this in the, after the talk um, and then like literally told me this like five times after, was she never throughout her entire degree has come in contact with how math can be a part of an indigenous culture. And she was sort of like really shook up by it because like she spent, you know, five years doing or whatever, four or five years doing her undergrad yeah. and never thought of this one particular subject in that way. Yeah. Um, no one has ever pointed out to her that you can think of it this way. And, yeah. and she was like, thank God I finally did, but how upsetting is it that yeah. all along I haven't had the opportunity to. Um, so I just want to thank you for um, sort of bring for, for making the difference to, yeah. to her and like students like this, right? And uh, highlighting the importance of pointing it out and like really making it explicit. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, I, and I think this is part of the, the problem with colonialism is the, this oppression of the knowledge that was here. Like, you know, I would say that Mi'kmaq built canoes that went from Cape Breton to Newfoundland, right? Like the ferry frequently can't get from Cape Breton to Newfoundland, right? Um, but, but they had canoes that could Pablo, do that. Pablo, like, me ayuda? It's okay. like the... the the, um, the depth of the knowledge and we don't right. honor it or like looking at the technology of a snowshoe, right? And there's, if you look at snowshoes right across the country, they're different. They're similar, but they're different. And they're different because of the kind of snow mm -hmm. and, and the different kinds of snow. Or if you look at canoe paddles, they're similar, but different because of the kinds of rivers, the, the depth or the shallowness of the river. And all of this is, is, is deep knowledge that has been in this territory forever and and you know these ideas are never really taken up in in our education system and that's one of the powerful things about the show me your math projects and bringing those those uh, culturally based inquiry pieces in is that it really helps to see um how that how that all comes to pass or whatever right so that it's really a way of honoring that traditional knowledge because yeah, we don't talk about math in our anthropology classes yet. It's so highly relevant. It just seems like we so clearly compartmentalize the things that we yeah. talk about, right? If yeah. you're going to do indigenization in math, it must be in math. If you're going to do mm -hmm. an if you're going to talk anthropology, you're only talking anthropology. Yes. So that's, yeah. I think that's that that's what needs to be changed. Yeah, Dwayne yeah. Donald has a great article about colonial logics and how we need to disrupt them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank uh, you. I see Susan has her hand up. Hi, Susan. Hi. Hi, everybody. How are you? 
very good. Good to, to see who I can see here and to know yeah. others here as well. Um, I just want to ask you a little bit about um, the Waltus game, you know, whether it makes it, I mean, I think it does make a difference whether you play it with paper plates and, you know, um, little plastic chips or whether you play it with a, a Waltus bowl and um it, it does i mean obviously like it's nice to to play a, a real game uh, i think what what we're trying to do with kids is like uh, uh, an actual waltus game costs about two thousand dollars to have made um because it's just it's really time consuming and it comes the bowl itself is made from a burl of a tree so you have to find kind of like this piece and then you have to sand it down and there are very few people who actually know how to make them traditionally like um so obviously you know in a perfect world we would we would play with the the right kinds of tools um but what it allows us to do with the paper plates and the and the popsicle sticks is is to teach kids about the game um so that they learn how to play the game there's not the heft of it though like there's something heavy about a waltus bowl and heavy and you know it's funny because what you do is you put a blanket in between you and you bang it down and and you kind of you have to do this like you wave your hand and there's an expression that you say as you wave your hand over it and um to kind of like make the dice sit down but but the first few times i played i bruised my thumbs because you're like banging it down and you realize like, hey, my hands have never played ball just before. And I had like the, the fleshy part of my hand was all bruised. <laughs> it's just like, it's a Waltus injury, right? But mm -hmm. yeah, so there's something about the heft of it and the, and the texture and stuff that's really important, but um, the variation does allow us to, to teach the kids. And so it's something that the teacher um, who's from the community uh, and she had sort of, this was her work around to get the kids practicing the game so they could learn how to play it and eventually they did get the real games to play with as well, so. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I think there's just something about, um, in schools we have a lot of paper and a lot of plastic, <laughs> a lot of paper. And so then there's the whole thing about making things that yeah. are supposed to be sacred objects, making them out of yeah. paper or yeah. you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's different. yeah. Yeah, then this particular teacher actually does a ton of um, on the land learning now. She's she's actually part of her master's project was doing place based learning. And so she's now taking them outside all the time. And and so I, I, I wonder about that myself. And if I ever get to go back there um, of COVID is over, <laughs> I will I'll get to play outside with them, too. But yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's lots great. of fun. Yeah. I see Vanessa has her hand up. Hi. Hi. How are you? Thank Good, you for how are your, you? Doing well. Thank you for your talk. Oh, no um, less of a question, more of a comment. Um, recently, I was in a meeting and we were discussing and in, in a math department with mathematicians talking about indigenizing the curriculum and how as you know, teaching upper level mathematics courses, we often feel like, well, we're going to do this kind of surface level example and just feeling overwhelmed as though we can't necessarily um, honor both the mathematics and the indigenous knowledge and like mm -hmm. finding that balance is challenging. Um, and I'm so excited. I'm going to use, I'm teaching um, the math for elementary school teachers class this semester. And uh, in a few weeks we're doing geometry. So I'm going to use your uh, Desmos <laughs> lesson. I think that's going to be yeah. fun. Um, but I just w wanted to point out, and I think uh, something I brought up was that in trying to indigenize the curriculum, it's not, doesn't need to be example and content driven, but can be driven in terms of pedagogy yeah. and the actions and the way that we exist in our classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think now, you know, I always thought of it as, you know, uh, emphasizing group work and community and different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And But now this idea of verbing is another way to indigenize and, and bring that mm -hmm. way of thinking uh, is, yeah. is great. And I'm so excited to uh, bring that forward and think of it yeah, more actively. And one of the things I always think about too is to not like, you know, I think I think sometimes the language is a barrier. Mm -hmm. And I saw somebody making comments about language learners. And so sometimes the formality of mathematics language can be a barrier. And if we just create space where kids can do something and talk about what they do, and that's whether they're little kids in kindergarten or university kids, right? Uh, 
still call them kids, even though some of my students are my age. Um, <laughs> but, the, you know, if they can figure out something and talk about it in a way that makes sense for them, and then we can introduce the language. And I think that piece is something that, like, it, it's a it's a language learning strategy, right? When you figure it out, you name it. And I think that whole piece around the verbing, um, but giving them things that are, that allow that structure to emerge, right? Whatever and, that structure is that we're looking for. And having the opportunity to just practice talking about it yeah. uh, in that kind of ad hoc manner. Today, I was mm -hmm. teaching my, again, my math for elementary school teachers, and we were uh, talking about story problems and, uh, you know, creating problems that would work for certain um, computations. And uh, they were saying, I just, it's so hard for me to talk about this. And I said, that's normal. You know, you have mm -hmm. to talk about it to improve yeah. in talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that and that's true for uh, a university calculus course as it is for a grade two class, right? It's mm -hmm. you need to learn to practice how, like, what do you see and how do you express what you see? And it's okay mm -hmm. if you don't use the formal mathematical language, because when you express what you see, we can then introduce what mathematicians exactly. call that. My, I, I frequently use the expression, yes, mathematicians name everything and they call it this, right? <laughs> and they name it so they can do new things to it. So we wanna try and do that too. Yeah. So thank you. No problem. Alyssa. Uh, I was actually wondering a little bit you mentioned a lot of times that the kids kind of like debate with each other and they they are talking a lot about that and I feel um, when we get to once you get to students in university they're they're under the impression that you're not supposed to talk about math so I was wondering actually if there's some social aspect that you're including too that like we just don't do for um, I need to say that when I'm when I'm working in the Mi'kma schools this is just the nature of who the kids are. And it's partly the culture of the school itself. So um, we are, we did these drawing activities with kids and we wanted them to draw a picture of them doing math and them in math class. And what we looked at when we saw them in math class was that the teacher was rarely present in the picture. Mm. And, and, but what was present was group work and kids moving around. So it's part of the culture of this school. So when I come in and I bring these activities, it's just normal practice. They do a lot of learning centers. They do a lot of moving small group conversation. Um, the teachers themselves, we're actually writing a paper about this. The teachers themselves have fostered this, this notion of independence in the classroom where it's like, you know, this is what you're gonna do when you come to this table and you're gonna work on this task. And that, you know, the teachers do float a lot and have conversations with kids, um, but it's part of the nature of that. And, and uh, what I fear <laughs> it often is that at some point, somebody's going to shut them down, right? And tell them, no, here's how you do it. Follow these rules. We're not going to talk about that. Like my niece, who, when she was in, in public school um, in grade five, um, fell in gym class in phys ed class and, and got a concussion and um she went back to her math class and i said well why didn't you talk to your teacher and she said well we were doing math and we're only allowed to sit in rows and and not so i, I was like i'm not sure what i'm more upset about the concussion that nobody noticed or that you were sitting in rows doing textbook questions in grade five, right? And and so, you know, not all schools are created the same. So there's a there's a pedagogical structure that we need to put in place that mm -hmm. creates that community too, right? Which we want kids to talk about mathematics. And it's unfortunate that we shut that down a lot of the time. Yeah, it, it becomes something like there's a myth, I guess, that it's yeah. a, a solo. Yeah thing and I mean for me math is very social I don't mm -hmm. I don't do good research when I can't talk to anybody yeah, and same. <laughs> like this this whole thing so I try to get my students to to talk to each other but I mean when it's online it's yeah. it's already very it's, difficult but they're yeah. they're just so like no I don't want to I'm, I'm not supposed to they're scared of saying something stupid like it's yeah. this there's a real fear there yeah and there's there's layers and layers and layers of, of storylines at play um Dave Wagner and Beth Herbal Eisenman write about um, storylines and positioning theory. And it, it's really interesting to think about how this, 
so many students have internalized these stories, right, about who they are as mathematicians and what they're capable of doing. And, and it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And we need to shift those storylines. Yeah. Greg. I just had a comment kind of related to that as well. I, I think that as math teachers, we, you know, it's, it's almost, it's so hard for us not to jump in and to let that productive struggle happen. Like I was lucky enough to be a part of, um, like I'm sure, I don't know, Lisa, you probably know Laura Brake, I'm assuming. Um, lucky enough to be a part of her project over the last couple of years. And that was one of the biggest things I took from her was this idea of productive struggle, right? We see them struggling. They look to us right away for us to jump in. And it's so hard not to because it's ingrained in us, right? But, you know, letting them have that moment and find their voice and letting them have that conversation about, you know, whatever they do know, right? It's, it's not about getting it right from the beginning. It's about, you no, know, what can you do here? What do you know? Let's have yeah. that conversation and then struggle a little bit. And then if it gets to the point where you're really lost, then that's where, that's where we'll jump in. But I think that a yeah. concept of productive struggle is so hard for us to yeah. kind of, you know, not, not jump in there and allow that to happen. That process is so important. My, my first few years of teaching, I would take kids' pencils from their hands do their work for them and go see you know how to do it right it's just like because a, a chronic helper I take my own pencil now. A chronic <laughs> helper that's it. it's like yeah i agree i do the same thing only my own pencil now because of covid yeah exactly <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> no i i tried on it's really hard not to but i know it's one right of those things that I think and, and it's like yeah. it's the hardest thing because like we got into teaching because we like to help and we also know really cool tricks and we're like i want to show you the really cool trick i know and you know <laughs> it's like oh if you you're yeah. you're so close yeah it's, it's sometimes painful for me like to, <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it's true. And that's the thing with the tricks too, is that the understanding needs to come first, right? The tricks yeah. are okay, but the understanding needs to be there first. So, and yeah. they don't get that understanding unless they go through that process of productive struggle. Exactly. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. It is. It's tough. I'm a, I'm a recovering helper. <laughs> Agreed. Me too. Are there any other questions? If not, Lisa, did you want to hang around or? I, yeah, I can hang around for a few more minutes if people have questions, but um, just thanks everyone. Thanks.